Okay, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Thank you so much for being here tonight, everybody. So welcome to our inaugural, inaugural uh, lecture for the 2018-2019 BW Bastion Foundation uh, Diversity Lecture Series here at Westminster College. And this is in conjunction with the Westminster College LGBTQIA Heritage Series. Done, uh-oh. Fix that in a second. So my name is Chris Davids. My pronouns are he, him, and his. I'm an assistant professor here in the psychology department and also have the pleasure of working with Dr. Marco Barker as the faculty fellow for diversity, equity, and inclusion here. So tonight we have a variety of distinguished guests that I'd like to acknowledge. Um, first and fo foremost, I'd like to uh, welcome our guest here, Keulandai Barrett. So welcome. Yeah. We also have several leaders on campus who are with us tonight, so I'd like to welcome Dr. Beth Dobkin, who is the Westminster College president. We have, uh, we have our interim provost and founding dean of the Honors College, Dr. Richard Bodenhausen. We have our associate vice president for diversity, equity, and inclusion, Dr. Marco Barker. And last, I'd like to welcome our faculty chair, Dr. Heather Batchelor. So in addition, we have a ton of community members here with us. I'm very excited for that. And I'd also like to, again, extend a welcome to all of our students, staff, and faculty who are here at the college. It's great to see everybody. So, yes. yeah. <laughs> okay. So our presenting sponsor is the B.W. Bastion Foundation which supports local and national institutions that benefit, encourage, and preserve the rights of individuals, promote equality for the LGBTQ plus community, and support HIV and AIDS programs. We also would like to acknowledge the following organizations. We have our title level sponsor, PepsiCo. Silver level, silver level sponsors that include Cigna, Rocky Mountain Power, U.S. Bank and the Dodo Restaurant. I'd also like to express my gratitude to both Sophia Katrubis and Dr. Marco Barker for their support in planning with this event. So again, I am so excited to welcome Kay Ulandai Barrett here to Salt Lake City on our very own Westminster College. Kay is a nationally recognized poet, performer, and cultural strategist, navigating life as a disabled, Philippinex American, transgender queer. Kay has been featured globally from Princeton University to the Hemispheric Institute and National History Society. Their ideas have been broadcasted by PBS NewsHour, Nylon, Color Lines, BuzzFeed, Huffington Post, KPFA Radio, and WBAI Radio. Kay is a three-time Pushcart Prize nominee and has received fellowships from Lambda, Lambda Literary Review, VONA Voices, The Homeschool, and Drunken Boat. Their most recent publications include works in upcoming anthologies such as Subject to Change, Outside the XY, Queer, Black, and Brown Masculinities, and Writing the Walls Down, a convergence of LGBTQ voices. Tonight, Kay will perform works from their first collection of poetry, When the Chant Comes. Following Kay's presentation, there will be time for questions and answers, and I encourage everyone to ask questions that help deepen our understanding of Kay's performance this evening. Please also know that tonight's performance is being video recorded. Photography is welcome, without a flash, and all photos that you use on social media we ask that you please tag our guest. Tag the college too. <laughs> so with that being said, please give a warm welcome to Kay Ulandai Barrett. Hey everybody, to 
check one, two, one, two, check one, two, one, two. I did not get a Janet Jackson lavalier. <laughs> Usually my rider, it's like my deepest dream. But just imagine it, right? Rhythm Nation going in, some of you may be too young. So. <laughs> my apologies, I just aged myself. Um, so yeah, today is hot. Tuesday, Wednesday, what's the day? Tuesday. Tuesday. Y'all watching poetry on a Tuesday. Yeah. Woo, nerds. <laughs> uh, so thank you so much um, for having me. Thank you, Marco, Chris, Sophia, for coordinating this. Uh, thank you for your time. And so I'm just going to kick it off. But before I do so, how many people up in here are Filipinx, Filipina, Pinoy, Pinay, any of those things? There's like three people, they're all my friends. <laughs> We're all gonna have boba tea after this. Oh, um, cool, cool. How many people here identify as queer? Anybody? Cool. Yeah. 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 Uh, how many transgender and or non-binary folks in the house? Yeah. How many people had to like raise all their hands, arms, and legs? <laughs> yeah, cool. So before I start, I come from the tradition and the lineage of 90s hip hop, as well as Filipino national organizing. And we do this thing called the bug sock. It means the one clap, the one hit. It's when you're in a space, a collective space, and we come to a decision that we feel good about, that we feel enriched by, that our conversations are moving forward, or we all decided we're gonna do something together, we do a bug sock, and that means a clap. But before I start, I would just like us, you know, we're in the US empire right now. This is no joke. We're at an elite institution. We're surrounded by white supremacy and straight folks. Um, and so to start us off, I would like you all to share an intention. And if you could think of one person, that person could be yourself, a family member, a friend, an ancestor, your dog. This is a gay community, so your, your pet. Um, <laughs> hold space for that one spirit. So if you can take a deep breath and inhale and exhale, you all have that spirit. So when I say isang bagsak, you can, whatever you're able to do, clap, scream, or shimmy. Ready? So hold, uplift that spirit again, and inhale, exhale. Isang bagsak, isang bagsak, isang bagsak. First poem. Uncertain, I come to crying, just crying. Soluble tears imprinted on the lines of notebook pages and my lover's cotton sleeves. See the rubble and weight that this body, this container holds. It includes my mama's voice. Her clock runs by overtime shifts. The current warring of her birthplace, the Filipinas, cannot enter her mind. You see, she doesn't have the time. Besides, she sent with her money in Manila envelope. She sent used shoes and brand name clothing for Familia back home. And who was it that said that in America, you're rich, 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 rich? Whoever made such a lie hasn't felt the burden on the skin. Brown black person limited to manual labor, factory blue collar hours, spitting out your happiness, spitting out your happiness, in spite of the poet or thinker parts of you. Day in, day out, whoever made such a lie has never been that so black or brown person to white eyes at an all-white academy. At home, yo, at home though, there is Lumpia Shanghai Echoes, pages away from the Domino's Pizza, right next to my mom as she's holding a fun sip as she holds a Coca-Cola in her hand. Plenty of the sponsors Pepsi, because my mom's household was not a Pepsi household. <laughs> All of these decoratively spread before me upon my welcome, and we sit, we listen. This is what you do in the company of elders. You fall asleep and your head nod. All my friends, beaming activists and theorists who consider watching any documentary on Netflix on a Saturday night, that's supposed to be fun. But no academic institution had the words my mom had. The veins in her arms permeating HMO Blue Cross insurance, her hands roughened from cooking, her eyes aglow, she spoke commonplace of her captivity. Young ones, huh? I know two places, work and home, home and work, work and home, home and work, work and home, home and work, work and home, home and work. Activists, students, what do you know? 
and a needle sharp pain is in my throat. As I look over to the face that's gonna be mine in 30 or so years, see, I used to know my mom's when she was precarious and fun, jumping rope with the neighborhood kids and me. Our mom's sucking the juice from paleta stick, their bodies ragged, and out lived would take me down the summer in just one day. And when we were little, when we were kids, we, we didn't understand the, the, the sweat, the sacrifice of our parents then. See, now, now, <clears throat> if you're lucky, if you get that scholarship, pull yourself up by the bootstraps, code switch, speak white language, you get to study them. You study the wars, the refugee status, the papers are papers you are not getting. Your grandmother, your Lola's last dream in Tagalog. You cry out in gutted sentences, cupping hope, knowing that it isn't enough to be a woman, or a person of color, or poor, or queer, or migrant, or disabled, but enough to fight against being made small fragments. Um, Tears swell on a weekday morning because the U.S. sees it fit to send in 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 troops this fall and trample on a constitution, on a constitution I've only read about. You see, the Filipinas, it's charted land. It's like my mother tasting her freedom, tasting her freedom, even after it never arrives. And yesterday, yesterday, ooh, Yesterday, I held my mother close, and of the three languages we know, our skin is the softest. She wraps up fried food, the scent in our clothes, in the corners of our mouths. Everybody, thank you for coming, take care. Study hard on your midterms. Sorry for my little house. Sorry for my little house, that's supposed to be funny. The same woman who pounded into my childhood that report cards were methods of survival. That same woman that changes a grimace to a smirk, knowing that her girl boy faggot budding child, this is me, kiss his face with another girl boy gay child like this in front of her, Ooh. <laughs> says this to my friends. And I sit here, plagued by those words, waiting for the ending of a poem that refuses to apologize. Thank you. So I was a kicked out homeless youth. Uh, complication, you know, I, it's interesting, national coming up, this is my month, October. I am a four from, so it's National Philippine American History Month. It is national coming out day. What else was October? Wasn't it like Poetry Month or Poetry Day or some shit? So I'm like a threefer. You're getting three people all at once. This is what diversity is. Um, so as I kicked out youth, I have complications with my homeland and my homeland fed me. And I remember being a younger person and like white people or people who just didn't have my experience being like, you know what you should do to come out? You should just write a letter. And I was like, no, no. <laughs> not my life, right? Um, and it's also not my life to, it's my life to navigate, right? To navigate American systems. And the, the, when my mom moved here and was forced here through migration, uh, part of that script wasn't just to make money or to assimilate into whiteness, it was also to be straight, right? So that's difficult, even though Philippines has such a rich culture. So here's this poem. And it's, uh, how many people know Sonia Sanchez? She's a gorgeous blues poet, please, from Philly, and arguably one of the best blues poems, poets ever, so this is after Sonia Sanchez. The streets are not paved with gold. They lied. I got a rough throat. I got a rough life. The streets are not paved with gold. They lied. I got too much purity to live in the night. And my mama, she found me waist up in you. I said, my mother found me, there's a sound, waist up, right when I'm about to talk, talk about sex, drinking you in front of the school president. Um, <laughs> my mother's up there like, Ay, Nicole, what are you doing for a job? <laughs> oh my god, oh my god, at least your haircut looks good, oh my god. 
I said, my mama found me, waist up, baby, drinking you. My mom said that I was the devil, made this journey here waist. Couldn't I just make some money? Enough, please work hard. Couldn't you just wear some lipstick, huh? It's so hard in this country for us. Couldn't you just behave? My mom said, you better leave this house, her spirit filled with ache. My belongings freckled the streets. This journey here is not self-made. I say all you laughing and juking in the alleys. I say all you kissing the roaches' cries. I say all you holding hands and couch surfing into the next night. I say all you loving, despite the fucking fights. Together, we're an anthem, a prayer, a song, no matter what. Together, we're bigger than all their hetero, cis, straight, white fuss. Together, we're louder than all the world's unsaid. Together, we're as mighty as our ancestors, up from the dead. Because we are bigger than the skylines that hold us. We are bigger than the sirens that stab our hearts. We are bigger and better and stronger than Boys Town progress, rainbow flags, and bars. We are bigger than bleeding our blood to the stars. Because together, chosen family, we are an anthem, a song, a prayer, no matter what. And together, we are bigger than all their heterosis, straight white plus. And together, we are larger than all the world's unsaid. Together, we're as mighty as our ancestors. Up from the dead. Thank you. So, um, let me see. I am a gay, but not really. Like, kind of like G U H dash A Y Y Y Y Y Y Y. You know, like we're in 2018, and I really wanted, I really want us to to talk about 2018, right? And. Um, <laughs> Like, the complications about that, right? Like, I'm a really big Hailey Kiyoko fan. <laughs> okay, cool, cool, cool. It's a problem to say. She's like in her Instagram, Hailey Kiyoko, for full context, is the first queer woman of color who's won like an MTV Video Music Award as a queer woman, has come out as a queer woman, and um, is mixed race, Japanese, and I think white. Um, but then on her Instagram, yo, she's like, I wish my eyes were blue, right? Like, this is the first, or is like, Oh, yeah, most of my videos besides the Kehlani video. How many people know Kehlani? I mean, yo, look her up. Google her. Right? Um, there's a video where they're just joyous and making out. And I realized in that video that I had never seen queer women of color, black and brown, making out on TV. That's some weird shit, right? I'm like, oh, is this how straight white people feel, like, joyous all the time when they're on TV? Like, this is a great feeling. I would feel so excited if this was a feeling I got 24-7. Um, so I dated an uh, adult Filipina, and we had everything in common. We drank coffee the same. We liked dogs the same. Um, our fashion was on point. Pero you know, uh, she didn't want tiny humans. She didn't want children. How many people like the babies and the kids? <laughs> yeah, some people are like, yes! And other people are like, fuck <laughs> Right, like she would hold a baby and the child would like have their hair knotted and like drool all over. I'm like, isn't it cute? And she's like, I don't, I don't want this. <laughs> so this poem is um, Letter to My Unborn. If I were stronger, I would have had you like I planned. Alone in a hospital bed, legs thrumming, out of breath is you would just be figuring out your new ways of being. Guarantee we would grow as hungry as homeland dreams, as distant as an atlas or map is to a newcomer of this empire. We would wander, drift, resemble lost balik bayan and worn luggage. We would send message in passive aggression. An uneaten bowl full here, a haircut born from rebellion there. And oh, my child, we would be like my mama and I. We would send a message in passive aggression. And, okay. Huh, my body doesn't want to do the baby poem. Is that okay? Can I do a different poem? That's not about the babies? It's so strange. I was like, do I not want to talk about children? I guess not. I guess I don't want them anymore either. Okay. <laughs> it's funny what your spirit does. Um, oh, we're going to do a serious poem. Mm, mm, body said to do this poem. So, Itopa, how many poets do we have here? Again, is it just my friends? Like, <laughs> we need to work on that, y'all. Um, so if y'all are like, I'm a writer, cool, to me that's still poetry, it's cute. Uh, poetry <laughs> lesson. Some of the poets are like, hey, don't say that out loud, you're gonna give people ideas. Um, 
Poetry Lesson 101. Do people know the form cento? Cento. Oh, it's my favorite form ever. When I studied poetry as an undergrad, what had happened was a teacher was like, we're going to take um, usually Anglo-Saxon white poetry, and you excerpt lines, and then you create a new poem, right? I, as a brown young person, was told that that was plagiarizing. <laughs> but if you are a white poet from Britain, it's creating a new poem. <laughs> so through my ethnographic research, because I don't, I just use the ethno, word ethnographic because I'm in a university or college, um, <laughs> and everybody's like, yes, yes, and nobody really knows what it means. Um, <laughs> this poem is not written by me, no. Nah. It's written by sick and disabled queer people and people of color. And what we did was really do an informal study. And what happened was, was you're on a bus and somebody says something anti-black. Uh, we're sitting down and hanging out with friends at a coffee shop. Somebody says something misogynist. Somebody says something anti-migrant. We're like, oh shit, poet. <laughs> So the title of this poem is, You Are So Brave. How many people have heard you're so brave before? <laughs> I like how everybody's just laughing and he's like, oh, shit. <laughs> um, yes, so, you know, and I'm like, yes, we're all so brave for just breathing. That's, that's great in the system. So this is for you all. And full content warning. I believe in content warnings for intense ableism, intense racism, intense uh, trans, trans hate. Um, I should just do that for my whole set, huh? <laughs> like, content warning, hard shit. <laughs> Get a snack after. <laughs> Starts with an epigram or epigraph. Kanan will probably check me later. I don't know what it is. <laughs> and those scars I had hidden with smiles and good fucking lay open. And I don't know any more tricks. I am really colored. And really sad sometimes. And you, you hurt me. Yosaki Shun. What happened? Oh, sweetie, do you want me to get that for you? What do you mean? No, thank you. You don't want my help? Some people are so ungrateful. I was helping you. You are so brave. Please step on the scale. Please step on the scale. Please step off the scale. You are so brave. I've never seen someone on a dance floor, a protest, or event move like that. What up here? Can I, uh, I would love to touch your cane. Does it hurt? Quote, people with disabilities are often seen as flawed beings whose hope of normalcy rests on becoming more like non-disabled people or on becoming cured. Quote, sins and God. When will you get better? Oh, don't worry, everything will be normal soon. Look, if you just try hard enough, you will heal. If you just pray hard enough, you will heal. Have you tried acupuncture, water therapy, turmeric, meditation, singing the Star Spangled Banner backwards only in your homeland tongue during the first moon during Venus in retrograde? I bet you, you haven't tried the right kind of turmeric. If you just take these herbs enough, you know, You'll be like you were, better, normal. Oh, why are you walking so slow? This is the city of hustle, son. Buck up, dear blank. I understand that you have accessibility needs, and we as a queer, progressive organization love, love, we just love your work. But we unfortunately, we, we find that your requests to be Kind of unrealistic, we understand that you are queer and transgender and a person of color hmm, with limited income. But we, we cannot fund you at this time. Please though, do send us samples of your work so that we may distribute them to our participants for free. <laughs> Dear insert assigned at birth name you were given, that frankly makes you feel like hurting yourself. It has come to our attention that you are 100% disabled. Disabled people do not work at all. You cannot work at all, do not move, do not leave bed. Disabled people do not have relationships, do not have love, do not work. Does it hurt still? Classification, no prolonged standing, walking, 
steel pin osteonectomy, Aiken McBride, constant deviance, constant deviance, constant deviance, cane usage and wheelchair usage to support impediment and prolonged limb. Oh my! Ooh, look at that hair! Don't you have a boyfriend to come to physical therapy with you? Quote, seen as flawed beings whose hope of normalcy rests in becoming more like non-disabled people or by becoming cured. All right. For the report, we're need, gonna need to see some ID. <laughs> That's hilarious. Whew. Oh, shit. Whew. All right. Um, you were attractive one. You used to look like a girl, like an actual woman. What happened to you? Please step on the scale. Please step on. So you were attacked. What did you do to motivate the attack? Your kind of people always do something to motivate the attack. Okay, for this paperwork, I have a couple questions. I'm not understanding some of the words you've used here. Um, what exactly does legibataqua mean? <laughs> Legibataqua. Legibataqua? Oh my god, there are like no vowels in it. <laughs> well, ma'am. We have to use the biological sex it says on your paperwork. It'd be nice to know if you wore some lipstick or rouge. It would kind of help you with this whole entire process and make it easier. Does it hurt still? Hasn't it been years now? I mean, why, why aren't you better? Based on your old life, don't you want to be more like me? Hey, do you have a fundraiser? I don't know any disabled people personally, but we can raise funds to help you because we think you deserve it. This is the city of hustle, son. If you can't get it right, buck up. You don't know what you are doing. Oh, you're so slow. It's hard to believe you can even take care of yourself. You are so fucking pathetic. What would you do without me? Does it hurt still? Yo, homie. Yeah, cool. Happy Pride. Yeah, I got my outfit ready. Yep, so we're going to go to the club. There should be some cuties there. Oh, yeah, there are stairs, dude. I'm sorry, there are stairs. I forgot. The march is 2.5 miles long. Maybe you can just meet us at the rally. Oh, look at that little boy with the cane. Why do I have to get up, chink? You want my seat, faggot? So, do you say you were attacked? Why do I have to get up, chink? Hey, I'm talking to you. Do you even speak it in English? Just look at that kid. He thinks he's like disabled, but I bet you he's faking it. If you have any concerns around safety at this event, conference, or protest, please really bring up these concerns with this cisgender, rad, skinny, white, able-bodied person who, conf who confuses wellness and yoga work for everybody gets better work. <laughs> Wait. <laughs> Is that supposed to be a girl? Oh, you look so cute when you dance. Let me take a picture of you. Okay, holding your back, great. Show the cane, show the cane. What did you do for somebody to attack you? You must have done something to provoke it. Please step off the scale. You know, if you just lose weight, if you weren't so fat, you'd probably heal better, right? We'll help you because we think you deserve it. Not like some people with disabilities, you know, the ones that drool and make a fuss. Constant deviance, constant deviance. Constant deviance. You'll be normal soon, won't you? Won't you? Ugh, I just haven't seen you in so long. Why don't you go out? It's not far. It's just a few blocks. Oh, I know you're in pain, homie, but you can make it, dude. I believe in you. What do you mean, no thank you? You don't want my help? Please step on the scale. Please step on the scale. Please step off the scale. Thank you. What poem goes after that? Astrology. <laughs> that's, that's my segue. Um, <laughs> my sun sign. OK, so before I start that real thing, uh, I feel like queer people, trans people, non-binary, gay people, love and bisexual folks love to talk about astrology. And I think there's a reason because US systems and governmental systems don't really support us. So we're just going to fuck it. We're just going to reach out to the stars, right? <laughs> <laughs> like, the things that are tangible in front of us are failing all of us. So God, universe, unicorns, whatever, let's get Jesus. Let's reach out, <laughs> right, to astronomy. And, and the real talk, just to let you know, 
My sun sign is in Virgo. Some people like yay, other people like, oh shit, we got one of those. <laughs> Before you celebrate, my Aries, uh, my Aries, exactly. My moon and my rising are in Aries. So, yeah, it's just a lot of fire. Like, it's just mad fire. And I just burped into the mic. And so, what this translates as Virgo, sun, Aries, moon, Aries, rising, is that I am highly excitable. I want to do all the adventures. I want to make out with everybody. I want to try all the spontaneous things. But as a Virgo, there will be color-coordinated itineraries and post-its to let you know, itemized, how much things will cost in the allotted time of which these things will occur. <laughs> this poem is called Tools to Survive Mercury and Retrograde. What this means is when Mercury comes back, Mercury says, you think you're doing good? Fuck you. <laughs> no, you're not. Let me tell you about yourself. <coughs> Tools to survive Mercury in retrograde. <coughs> Hide. <laughs> that's it, that's a poem. <laughs> Ain't nothing else, like, stay by yourself. Don't talk to me. Um, don't read old journals. You'll hate your poetry anyway because, let's face it, boo. No. <laughs> Burrow your head into every crease of the bed. Talk to no one. Embrace the mercurial by yourself. Take everything personally. Take heed of your sharpness. Take stock of your softness. Watch YouTube vids of fluffy, pudgy baby animals. Keep protein close. Let the aches in. They're choreographed to the impending storm clouds anyway. Reach out once, then curl into your skin to the speed of raindrops. Take nothing personally. Light candles. Crave any random sets of foods at your disposal. Much better to crave green mango shakes and pompano rather than the people they actually remind you of. Regret? Regret doesn't deserve an answer. Look, believe it or not, now is not the time for 90s R&B jams, salty snacks, and the gluttonous. Make sure nobody quotes you on that last statement. Hollow to the radius of any loss or any wind. Let the wind through this gap of you. Remember, the guilt, the guilt wasn't always yours. Wipe residue off your altar. Let the rain on your face be a proper disguise. Drink cups of water on the hour. Let the dogs be a shield of oxytocins and paw pads. Let the cats be a shield of oxytocins and paw pads. Let the lizards. I don't know, I don't fuck with lizards, but that's just ain't cool. I think it's a little weird, but I guess let them be a shield. If you can't howl, pay no mind. Your joints will do it for you. You know this already. Clasp your knees to your chest. Lullaby it out. Love, let her go. Injustice, let it go. Want, let them go. Don't eat all the pastries in that goddamn fridge, look. The gift, the problem isn't that you are not enough. The gift is that you are incredibly all too much. Hum yourself through. Your spirit will do it for you. If crumbled up, now is not the time to underestimate yourself. Remember, the fetal position is a damn fine place to write. Thank you. <laughs> So we're mid in the program where I get to be like hella queer. And I would just like to do again a call and response. Cool. Allies, if you want to fucks with it, you can. I invite you. If you feel uncomfortable, that's cool. This word is for us. But when I say queer, you say damn. And you fan yourself a little bit. <laughs> um, Cause say, you know, like self-love, nah. Uh, but also, I know how, I know I'm old, but I do remember how campuses are. And so, you know, as you're saying queer and you go down, you fly fi and you fan yourself and you can look over to your, I don't know, metamore, lover, date, crush, boo, whatever y'all do. I don't know the words anymore. And you're like, damn. Okay? So when I say queer, you go, damn. Ready? There's always one person in the corner who's so ready. Like, they're just like, damn, damn. Like, they're, they're steady crushing on somebody or themselves. Um, when Prince sang Queen live, the people in that, that song, Queen, get on top, can't sing, so I'm not gonna do more. Um, Prince is like, you know that song was about me, right? 
I was singing for me. And so just call on that. When I say queer, you want to give yourself some shine? Say damn. When I say queer, you say damn. Queer? Damn. Oh, come on. Y'all got more. Somebody over here is fanning for everybody. <laughs> when I say queer, you say damn. Queer? Damn. Queer? Damn. OK, sure enough. Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. You got it? So this poem is called When the Chant Comes. It's the title of my book. And how many of you all have that friend or family member who's known you since you did some fuck shit? <laughs> like known you since you were very messy? Like so messy, like if I were younger and it were on the internet, it would not be a great joke. <laughs> um, and they love you anyway. They love you through and through because they know what transformation is and they know what transformative justice is, right? And so this poem is for those people who show up for you, even when you don't show up for yourself. Cool? And this is in gratitude to my family, Andre and Neil Gardner. I told him what she said. How I told her about finally wanting to get top surgery and be on T, and how my then partner's immediate response was, hmm, do you want to be on T and get top surgery because you know, you're getting a little fat and you might need to lose some weight. Yeah, y'all, trash fire. How this broke me. It broke me. He, my best friend, bestie, sucked his teeth. A trustworthy mannerism we both got from our brown dead mama. See, he and I go way back. The way queer, hungry, brown kids can go way back, back to alcoholic boyfriends wearing bandanas and girlfriends and dates who couldn't keep their shit or their dental dance together. <laughs> back then, yo, we remembered back then when we were small and queer and dancing, working three or four jobs. Back then, we clocked in makeouts long before cell phones and apps scheduled them for you. We were brown kids who ate chips in 7-Eleven in Logan Square, Chicago, armed with deep, deep house music still on our hands, our north side and south side pride only made packs with street mail sponsoring when that club closed. See, I hated my chest then. Um, I always have. And we are no longer that young or that bold. He's now in LA in food service, hosting restaurants, singing ballads like he did when we first met. He attends daily meditation since. He's had years of me waging this war against my body. Long distance news made us hold our breaths over phone wires, made us hold a moment of silence. In my age, I told him, Dre, there has to be a chant for this. And he said, baby, I'll breathe, I'll meditate. And I will love you, and I will tell you when the chant comes. Thank you. So I perform this poem a lot because it's my book. And I was in Provincetown, like outside of uh, maybe like Boston, P-Town, right outside of Boston. And there's a line. I bet you all can scan it. There's a line that I'm always scared. Like, I'm going to pee my pants. I might fuck this up in front of you. And the line goes, he attends daily meditation sits. Well, when I was in Boston, what I, what I performed was, he attends daily meditation shits. <laughs> and I just let it ride. <laughs> so there were some cis white queers somewhere Googling daily meditation shits. <laughs> and I want you to know that that's also movement building. <laughs> Great. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> Moving from there, we're gonna do a poem for my chosen family member, and his name is Brandon Lacey Campos. He was a gorgeous Afro-Latinx pause activist and poet. And so, this is for Brandon. And it's a new poem. Uh, my second collection is coming out by Sibling Rivalry Press. It should be cute in 2019, so have a look. And this poem is gonna be in it. For Brandon Lacey Campos. When you hugged me, 
I circled my palm on thick flesh, gave it an extra second. Um, you never know the last time you get to love on somebody, see? You never know the last time you get to love on somebody ever. But it was obvious to me to feel, to feel honor. In West Village, New York City, we read this draft of a shitty poem. I read it to you during Monday, all you can eat seafood crab special as we unfolded bib and got ready for all the mess. There's a photo of this time. Each dimple of yours like a firework, a red-orange cartoon plastic of a crustacean waving over those big badass pecs, protection from splatters. I imagine your heartbeat a buffet for a proper eardrum. It reminded me that there were other dreamy men who weren't worthy, but here I was, together, that afternoon, we split tendons, cracked joints in to go, for, to go for the meat. In tears, I would summon my dead mama, and you would erupt over a buttery claw on how we learned to eat this way. Our mama, mama, mama watching over us, making sure we did everything just right. What I remember is that you, you cried too, probably about another friend you lost, and why does this world have to take away the good ones? And still, we cackled, and we could go on chismis all for hours, yo, feeling fed, feeling like at least we have handfuls of something. At least we are the ones at the end here, unbroken. Later that afternoon, you text me, oh my god, OMG, Adi, my lips are burning. I think I am allergic to Old Bay. <laughs> and I send, a fire emoji, LOL, silly face emoji, and tell you, oh no, I love you, hearts, hearts, hearts. We never get to meet up after that. I saved this text to hold on to the nuance, the kinship of pleasure and pain. In my mind, you eat everything that is everything, and there's a dance floor with a DJ who must be somebody's cousin, trusted cousin from up a block. And there is no blood spilled anywhere. And in my dreams, in our dreams, Kasama, there is not shame for a body, however it's sick, or black, or brown, or queer. There is not living or dead. And you, you're still with us. Face moist from the strobe lights, voice hoarse from loudspeakers screaming. We have poems. We have liberation. We have homes. We have medicine. We have each other. Indefinite. Thank you. So I have three more poems. Three more poems. Three more poems. Um, anytime I'm excited with something, when I'm with my girlfriend, we go, in it, and that's all we do. <laughs> we'll be in the whitest or most academic or corporate space, and we'll be excited about something, and she'll go, in it, and then I'll go, in it, and then everybody will stare at us, and we'll try to keep on this facade, like we're actually British. <laughs> but it doesn't work, because then I break into Tagalog, and they just bust into, you know, black av vernacular. So, when I'm talking about girlfriends or partners or polyamory or mates, lovers, is that, do people still use that word, or is that outdated? Somebody from the crowd, tell me, what, 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 what words do you all use? I've never had a girlfriend. Great. <laughs> That's cool. Hold on to that. Independence. Anybody else? Languages, languages. Do people really say metamorphs, or is that just in books? No. Yes. OK, cool. No, I mean, look it up, Google. We're here at a school. We can figure it out, right? Um, so that's when you have many partners. This poem is entitled, How One Might Have Behaved from 19 to 23. That's your demographic. The implication is that I was very foolish. <laughs> when you toss out your hips, woo, there invoked an earthquake, or maybe my heartbeats were like a chorus of drums, praising the choreography of your curve. Either way, make no mistake. We obviously equal tension. OK, content warning, totally a sex poem. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm always looking at like staffing like, you OK this? <laughs> How can lips accept a love so small? I want to delete the rulers, the scales, tell you the weight. The only weight you deserve is the sinking down on teeth, the sachet of fingernails as fierce and as soft 
as sunrise wind. We who want pinned wrists and stretched out mouths upturned like vagabond stars. We who are one part earth, Virgo, and one part fire, Leo, and only lava can take place here. We want ransack, dislocated lamps, sprained countertops on the blister of our back and forth. We want a pound, pound, pound skin into a luscious rhythm, the kind of sound only the psyche of summer can admit to. And you say, I like it rough. And I want the wind knocked out of you, not from the brute force, but by the jab of verb when your body splits into the mattress. You say, I like it rough. And I picture, palm to palm clutching, I want us to make our veins that same syncopated beat. You say, K, I I said I like it rough. And I say, OK. <laughs> Thank you, universe, goddess, lesbian Jesus. <laughs> Which is to say, we are two brown kids carnal with buckets of blood that just want to paint a good picture for once. Buckets, which sounds, mm, hmm, which kind of like sounds like the term bucket in our language in Tagalog, which means why, suggesting why not us? And by now, yo, you could only imagine what I would say if you were naked, because naked, naked I would cross stitch your smile and love you and you, you would leave. Bend over, vessel wide, yet walk away as soon as I reminded you how warrior you could get. Because naked, I'd show you cooling down curve and body stone slice all with our tongues, but without any words. So I just tell you, to put it simply, that I want to know your moan. So I just tell you that your lungs can unfold like maps if you let me find my way to you. Because writing about skin is only facade. The rest could contort this into a ballad that we both aren't really ready for. Instead, we coax an argument of coast to coast. It would get too expensive. All the travel too far. We're too far. People don't use phone cards anymore. What is Skype sex? I don't know. What is Skype sex? True. Ain't no pressure to use the word love here. We all know we've seized the juice from the syllables already, and that gets even the best of us nowhere. Besides, you like alcohol and love the burn down your throat. And I, I just think about it as poison. <laughs> this is one of the cons I wrote down on a list that makes us impossible. Funny, I did not write down your girlfriend's name. <laughs> if we are looking for a poem of morals, that is the poem you refuse to let me write, as it would only end with your vertebrae. A ceremony of kissing, a downbeat of rules snapping, a list of tabletops we tip over with our fondling and food, where our lust would be anything but a weapon, where our lust could have caused broken hearts, not excluding our own. Don't ask questions. Keep talking. Nerves, my nerves, can handle your blade. And at least, baby girl, thank goodness, we've always got that. Thank you. So how many people um, are on social media, on the Instagram, on the Tumblr, Tumble? What is the, what is the verb for that? Do you tumblr -er? <laughs> I don't know. This is where you know I'm hitting, I'm in my 30s, right? Like I'm really curious about these word choices. So if you're on Tumblr, Instagram, or Twitter, uh, please tag me or look at my shit. It's at brown, round, because I'm brown, right? I'm brown. Boy, B-O-I. Um, just again, full scale content warning, there is a lot of dogs. So if you're just like not a dog person, like I, I don't think that there's a binary. I don't believe queers are just dogs and cats. I know that there is nuance, but I'm really pro dog. And then um, if you're a vegan, it's your nightmare. <laughs> like for real, some of y'all call me like, yeah, y'all, he just talks about food a lot and like me. And then last, obviously, a lot of political content. So if that's not your jam, it's okay. I won't be insulted. So please follow me, give me inquiries or ideas or feedback or chats. Uh, content warning, this poem is hashtag for Orlando, for Pulse. And um, it's titled a following, a follow up from a previous poem called Rhythm is a Dancer. And I don't know if people know that song, Rhythm is a Dancer, it's just me, that's great. Um, <laughs> it's about queer club culture. I feel like queer club culture makes people survive. 
Um, before I knew what placards or protest signs were, it's obviously connected to music and being present in movement in the body. So this is for Paulson for our leader. And I hate this poem. I just hate it. I hate that I have to read it. When the responders came to a nightclub in Orlando, they announced, if you are still alive, raise your hand. Meanwhile, I was asleep in a bed I never thought I would have. See, people like us are used to lonely, are used to sobbing so hard that homes are like unfathomable dreams. We search for the rescue of safety in our own skin and reasons to just, to just hold someone's hand, you know? To just find a job that doesn't call us by the wrong name. To just find ourselves lost in music. Earlier that night, <clears throat> people didn't get to leave the dance floor. And what is the beat of bullets, really, when we are too used to percussion already? Cusses and threats pound into the seams of our skin. Of course, salvation is to tut and tick on our own terms. And tears are what dance sweat. So when the gunshots from the balcony seared the air, there were boys holding hands with other boys for the first time, which then, which then became their last time. And there were others trying to forget about a hard day to the lilt of sexy limbs at the lip of a bottle. And there were strobe lights that could have been falling stars, but instead, there were bodies? And before we die, <clears throat> before we die, some of us are already dead in family photos. Our own blood can close our eyes to us like caskets. In a club, there was a young person or five singing aloud who thought, yo, this is my jam. This is my favorite song. A palm up to the air, and the only place that was safe became Barrage. Glass shards, their friend's blood turned blanket. The next morning, the next morning, I couldn't stop crying, you know? And I tell you, I'll tell you, we've been crying a long time. We've lit candles at vigils like it's as every day as breath. We know the choreography of loss. If you are brown and queer and trans, you know that if there are no prayers possible, understand. Understand that we will ache and we will cry. And if you understand the choreography of beats on your face or into your heart, you know that a dance floor is protest, that a dance floor is altar. And you know, listening to your favorite jam with your chosen family at the club, that a song is never just a song. Thank you so much. which means them. Um, Filipinos, we, Filipinx folks, we don't gender things immediately. It's only when Spa Spain and the US came where they're like, okay, there are males and females, let's do that. Um, and this last poem is my obligatory trans poem because everybody who's trans and or non-binary we're always told, you have to do a bathroom poem. Let's talk about it because we're not allowed to go to the bathroom. And you can make solidarity around disabled folks and disabled bodies too, right? Like how bathrooms and buildings are just, for doing basic ass human things, are just not accessible to you. So this poem is my baño poem, I like to call it. Uh, obvious content, I will be talking about poop. <laughs> Again, my mom is somewhere like, Jesus Christ. <laughs> what are you doing in front of these white people? <laughs> I don't know. Okay. <laughs> exactly. That's how it's like hella timely, friend. Thank you for that cue. <laughs> Growing up, I hated bathrooms. The bleach singeing my nostrils. I pictured my brown mama in every white person's house, scrubbing tiles, making what other people took for granted shine. In airports, in airports, I 
can clinch my bladder, I could hold it until a third floor walk up in Harlem can turn bloody. See, there's this story that every transgender or non-binary person, or even if that's not your language and it's not English, um, reads. And it's, it's, it's not in the bladder. It's uh, beyond guttural. It goes something like this. I am real. I am real. Bathroom. And if what they say is true, that bathrooms are where we are all our most human, then I'm a dilapidated National Geographic, barely mammal, told to leave, even in the dirtiest of settings. Example, brown girl lowers her register like it's cobwebs and steel, slouches in a baggy shirt, goes beeline for that stall, doesn't want to wash their hands for fear of screams and anger and stunts the next day and the next until their partner's hands become pillows. Because even in your dreams, even in your dreams, people can still get your pronouns wrong. Next. They are told that as a B-O-I, that they are in the wrong place. So to drink a cup of water or orange juice is a hazard in waiting. And honestly, I wish I could. Just shit on every curse, on every time some transgender woman turns threat when she just wants to see herself in full length glory. Once a month, I want to be one of those obnoxious, Second wave, turfy feminists. Listen to me, you know the white ones? And I want to build a structure of blood that would make Rapunzel shiver. <laughs> and it would take the crimson to light because all oh, good poets, we just love the word crimson. <laughs> I am real, I am real, I am real. You do not have to punch it out of me. A bruised eye like a swollen gourd, a kicked rib, the density of a smashed plum. Do you know how long it could take some transgender people like me to actually accept a hug. Here is my blood. It ascends the repellent stairs. For hormones or not, I am no waste of time dumping ground to let you and your terrors haunt us in a whisper. Guess what? Spoiler alert. You aren't normal either. You, you there, you are not real either. That locker room hush, that road trip bus stop steak, that fast food restaurant stain on your shirt or your hair, saving it for later. Forgive me. You know how the story ends, but do you? Is it so wrong to just want to clinch your jaw in the light? Chart an altar from the new hair to the new hips to the new hairline. Sit alone on the throne on your social media, checking your Instagram or your Tinder, <laughs> swiping left or right, depending on the city of which you live, <laughs> and not be hashtag, not be gravestone, not be headline not crisis mode, not suicide, not erased, and most certainly, not be ash. And though I'm never clean, let me tell you, I'm never gonna be. Your colonization that forced my family here, damn well made sure of that, but what I do know is this. A brown migrant adult woman and her transgender child cannot grow up in your shit. Can I just, can I just feel the water on my knuckles, like baptism? Because we as humans, we are 60 to 70% water, and though I'm never clean, let me tell you, the tide of the ocean beats inside me, inside my people. Have you, have you ever tried to contain a wave or date a water sign? <laughs> nothing, nothing can take away their right to release. Thank you so much, Westminster. I appreciate y'all. Yeah, I guess there's a Q&A now. <laughs> yeah, so we'll, we'll take a few questions before we wrap up tonight. So. Um, yeah, we can go and start that, and then as a reminder, if you could please repeat the question for video, that'd be great. Cool, oh, got it. Hmm. Questions, comments? You're the shit, thank you. Thank you so much. That was really great when you said shit, and I just performed a poem about shitting, and I just want to thank you for that repetition. <laughs> I like that you said shit too. Yeah, let's just say it a lot in academia, just over and over. <laughs> uh, yes, 
middle person yeah. there. Um, when did you start writing poetry? When did I start writing poetry? Uh, I grew up really working class and poor, and, and with that said, my mom tried to put me in everything. She's like, you want to do dance? Dance. You want a violin? Accordion? Do it. Tennis? Blah, blah, blah. But um, poetry came to me naturally because my mom would be at her shifts, and she'd just like, write something. Here, I'm, help me clean, and while you're studying, let's write something together. So she really motivated me to write. I'm from Chicago, Illinois, so that's where Slam Poetry was founded. Um, yeah, and theater is really rich in Chicago, and POC organizing is rich in Chicago. Movement of Color Poetry is organizing is really strong. So I was always at the cusp of, if I would go to a political organizing meeting or some like community event, there was always poetry. That's just what I learned and knew. And I was really fortunate because I had mentors who were like, oh, who is this like tiny little brown dyke teenager bopping about saying things? Maybe you should just concentrate here and write something and not talk so much. So it was very helpful for me to really focus and to really, I just didn't have any stories at all when I was younger. I'd go to the library and be like, I, I, before Google, I'd be at the library with the big wooden drawers and I'd be like, let's look up Filipino transgender. Nothing. <laughs> right? So for me, writing from a young age and having mentors to really engage my writing, um, that includes folks from like, yeah, the Chicago slam scene to domestic workers organizing. There would always be song, poetry, and theater. Organizing was always cultural strategy. They were never separate. It's a very American dynamic to say that politics and poetry, politics and art are separate. So I learned from the get from migrants and undocumented mixed status both that like you need song, you need chants, you need poetry to archive what's happening in your life, or else we're not going to survive under these circumstances. Did I cover it? Was that legit? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Woo. A little spooned out, everybody. A little spooned out. Go ahead. Next question. I'm also a teacher by trade, so I'm really good with silence, like just. Sure. Live your life. <laughs> what do you What do you mean by cultural strategist? What do I mean by cultural strategist? Um, I'm talking about what we understand and perceive the world in the everyday. Like in reality, the cultures we develop. So pop culture is like mainstream culture. The way people may perceive blackness or might perceive queerness is a form of culture. And so for me, my job is to reimagine narratives and push back on mainstream narratives that shit on my people. Right? So as a cultural strategist, my relationship to my community is to create stories, to create archive, to navigate art and song, so that shifts broader culture that oppresses us. And I think that's a formidable thing to do, especially if we're thinking about the Trump regime or the Trump administration, where they want to take away money from the NEA, from the National Endowment of the Arts, the most mainstream hub of art, actually. And to say, you know, cultural strategy comes with understanding a decolonial process. When people try to colonize um, other places, when the US or other first world places go to the Philippines, for example, the first thing you learn is that they take away the art, the education, and the language. And so as a cultural strategist, those three places are the places where I like to explore, to engage, and make sure that whoever is at margins of center, whoever is being most impacted by this US empire, those stories are at the forefront for me. And for me, that's cultural strategy. Like, if all I hear is a queer woman of color who says, I wish my eyes were blue, then that's the predominant culture for women of color and gay women of color. But if I can push back and all my chosen family and people writing poems can talk about loving each other and loving darker skin or loving having brown eyes, that's re-navigating a mainstream culture. And it's a strategy. If people tell you it's not a strategy, they're lying because they don't want to hear your story. Yes, hand up. Um, as Queer people of color as queer brown bodies, um, a lot of times we find ourselves in moments of being spooned out, just being completely like, you know, empty. Mm -hmm. um, especially being so visible with the way that you just create, um, how do you handle those moments when there's just been back to back crises and you don't yeah. know what to do? Yeah. Um, so, as, as a queer, I'm going to summarize the book really short. As a queer brown body, um, how, who's so visible or who does this publicly, how do I move from crisis to crisis? There are a lot of things happening institutionally and in the world and in our society that operate in crisis mode, right? Like, you know, currently, 
That's a great question. That's a question I ask myself every day. Um, you know, the, you know, what, you know what questions I do get in the audience, just like from audiences yourselves are. Um, I'm a first generation college student. I'm surrounded by white people. What do you do to survive here? Um, I am a disabled person. I'm the only disabled person in my class. And people, people don't really speak to me. They speak over me or talk to my able-bodied friends. What do you do? Uh, my family and my parents are undocumented. And I'm a first generation born person in college. How can I support my family back home? Um, I'm a trans person. I see trans people of color being, I don't know, how many is it? 30 trans women of color just this year, roughly, who've been murdered. What do I do because all I see is trans death or black death? These are the questions I get for my job, university to college to classroom. The same questions over and over. And what does that do to your psyche? Not just for me, but for you all asking those questions. Like this room is a super complicated room, right? And I don't know what everybody's bringing in in their intersections. And so my honorable reception of that is to hold space for folks who usually in institutions like this or even in their own, maybe in their own partnerships or friend groups, don't get to talk about these things. Or have to push through and bootstrap and just get things done. Get a campaign done, get somebody out of a detention center, get a trans person some papers, get somebody their hormones, get somebody a place to eat, sleep, so for me, it's really just to be a conduit. That's my job, right? And to bring back to the people who grew me up. That's my responsibility. I think my easy elevator pitch answer is I eat a lot of steak. Um, <laughs> I watch a lot of reality TV shows on HGTV because there's a beginning, middle, and end, right? Like there's a freaking outcome. Um, I, I believe in dogs, I believe in pets, I believe in creatures. I think. In, Non-human creatures really know how to be salve in the way we're humans. We're just blocked by such intensity and emotion and selfishness. So I literally, on my Instagram the other day, like, if I see a dog, I'm like, eee! and I just run to it. It's probably really rude, but I do it anyway. Um, and I have a care circle. So when I say a care circle, um, there's this thing called Mad Maps that people use. I don't know if people are familiar, but when people have mental health difficulty, depression, uh, suicidal ideation, you know, there's, there's literally this thing called Mad Maps where you can talk about like, when I'm feeling anxious, when I'm feeling upset, when I'm feeling depressive, these are the signs. Here are the people to contact. Do not contact the police, do not call a professor, or maybe call my parents, or maybe contact my, my partner. And just like prep, prep for a storm, right? As a queer, trans, black, indigenous person of color, you are in the storm at all times. There is no privilege or leisure to have fun. So when you have joy, yo, like lean into it. You know what I'm saying? Like, you're kissing a partner, lean into that. Something makes you laugh, music makes you laugh, lean into it. Like, my friend Karadi, who's a trans Latina, we were joking. She went to a club on New Year, and she was like, yo, we like pulled out, we were all gold, we dressed up to the nines, my homie was dapper, I had a gown on, it was opulence. And I was like, yes, ma, yes, yes. She was like, and then I saw like these white, some basic twink white gay men, and they just wore like a polo shirt and shorts. And I was like, oh, like they have everything, and that's what they show up with. <laughs> that don't make no sense. And she's like, you know what? It's because, and we talked about it, we're like, because we don't know if we're going to be here next year. This is our last party for some of us, you know? So you're going to dress the fuck up. So for me, um, Marco was asking me, I really like aesthetic. I really like fashion as a style. That helps me to identify where my people are going historically. That really warms me, and people will deconstruct it and whatever, but I really find like food, fashion style, I'll say it, television, and having chosen family, right, and rotating. If you're disabled, you understand interdependence. So this person, they use the word spooned out. It's a term called spoon theory. You can Google it, it's a really awesome term that sick and disabled people use to itemize and understand units of energy. So for me, to get up in front of a lot of people could take five spoons. To get up to change is another three spoons. And you only have a selected amount of spoons to work with, right? So as a queer trans person of color, yo, you got selected, it's like a video game. We're fucking playing Super Mario, you know what I'm saying? You have these limited dots to go on. It's like, boop, 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 use that up already. Um, all I can say is to make sure you keep your chosen family close, that if you believe in spirits or God or some higher power universe to keep that close, um, to know that you are not the first one 
You're never the first or the only. There were always ancestors before you who made your way possible. And if you have chosen family who are cookers, who like to feed you, people with more money who like to offer you money to take care of you, always say yes. That's my strategy. Does that make sense? Cool. So maybe one more question. Perfect. Yes. Yeah. Um, if you had like, your, I don't really know how to word this, but if you right now were in like a position of political power, like a president, what would be like like the five things you would do first? I mean, you know, this is what I do in my daydreams, right? <laughs> like I'm saying, like this is what I would do. Um, I mean, I would make healthcare accessible for everyone, first and foremost. I don't think it should be privatized. As a disabled person working in disability justice, we all are eventually going to be sick. We're all going to die. Spoiler alert, in case you didn't know. Um, and I believe everyone, despite your demographic or your community, deserves full health care access. Um, I would shift the way people treat migrants and people in general who are undocumented in this country. I don't believe that there should be borders. I don't believe that we should be terrorizing communities just because they're not from where you're from, when actually you are a settler here in this land doesn't belong to you in the first place. Um, I would really engage in re-education and centering trans people of color and trans women of color first in everything we do politically, as far as access to food, housing, healthcare, education, job safety, for me those things are really important. And if you believe in voting politics, I would try to streamline, actually make those, those voting politics more accessible to folks. Um, I went into school, as a pre-law major, and then I was like, what the? Um, <laughs> and my double major was, was in political science with an emphasis of Latin American economy, because I didn't have Asian or Filipino economy before. And uh, gender women's studs, and minor in English. And so I, when I think about politics and political movement too, was I'd do the switch, is I would just fund arts. Like, I would just fund it till the cows came home. Like, the sky just had drip paint dripping everywhere. Right? So there was like structures and music and dance. Because I feel like if you can channel art in a way that finds answers, it breaks down all of the penetrable boundaries that we have. People can tell you where they were during a song. People can tell you who um, their favorite concert was. People can tell you when they look at a painting what that felt like. And I really feel art is really pivotal and structurally important for that. Um, and then also I would address you know, violence against women and femmes and non-binary people and all that structure. So if we're looking at the Me Too movement as an example, I would also then open that and engage more in non-binary and trans people and also have that discussion to be more tangible and have that really intersection, right? That it's not just white, cis, straight American women who have a certain demographic who are impacted by violence and misogyny. You know, how does race, how does anti-blackness, how does being a migrant impact those things? Like really hold people at whole levels. I don't believe that commonalities are that great actually. I really think that if we embrace and honor like the differences we have, we can really honor who we are and how we move in this world. So, I mean, off my, the top of my dome, last would probably, with, with healthcare, would be like access to food. All my communities are in food deserts. Um, I've been in, urban farming and, and justice like organizations led by black and brown and migrant people. So I would say to reclaim the land and not have Monsanto run everything and not privatize all the seeds. Um, I'm a little woo, so I believe in that stuff. But I love food, so I want everybody to eat it. <laughs> and I want the land to be honored so we can selfishly as humans flourish by it, but also honor the land which offers us our nourishment. Thank you. Great. Thank you so, are we on? Oh, there we go. So yeah, Kay, thank you so much for being here. Incredible performance this evening. I have a few announcements before we take off. So I'd like to remind everybody of a couple of additional BW Bastion uh, diversity lecture series events that we'll hear, have, have here at Westminster. Um, so for those of you who are um, Westminster College students, faculty, and staff, uh, we will host Dr. Catrice Albert who is the Senior Vice President for Human Resources and Inclusion for the NCAA on November 2nd for a luncheon to discuss inclusive excellence. In addition, we will host journalist Carlos Massa, producer with the news site Vox, on March 21st. 
That's also open to the public. For more information on these events, you can go to westminstercollege.edu slash bastion. Finally, for faculty and staff who are here tonight, we welcome to attend tomorrow's Diversity Learn and Lead on Unconscious Bias that we're gonna be doing from 11 until 12.30 in HWAC in the special events room. For those of you who are interested, Kay's going to stick around in the lobby tonight and will be selling uh, two of their books as well as additional merchandise that they've brought. And as you leave tonight's event, we ask you to please take a moment to complete the one item survey that we handed you when you came in. Just simply asks you how much did you, uh, how much did today's event strengthen your understanding of diversity issues? So please just tear the box that matches your response and return it to one of the individuals at the doors. So thank you for joining us tonight. Have a good evening. Thank you.